Welcome back to another video. In this one, we're going to be talking about a file structure that I use for every single video production job. Now on the surface, a file structure seems very basic and somewhat unimportant, but as you scale your video production services and your video production company, and especially if you are bringing more people on to help edit and help organize all of the footage in the background, then a really structured file management system that is consistent between every single project becomes really important. Now I've set up a file structure over the years and tweaked it and refined it and this is the current version of the file structure that I use for our production company and it's free for you to download. Link is in the description to this video. So once you download it and unzip the file, double click on the file and then you will get this file structure here. So in this video I just want to simply go through this folder structure and explain my logic for organizing all of our footage and assets associated with any video project. The main important thing to take away from this video is simply just to have a folder structure that is templated for every single project. So when you begin a brand new project, it doesn't matter if it's the fifth job for a client or the first job, it is the same templated structure for every single project. So let's take a look at O1 audio. When we're on set, we're obviously capturing audio with the camera. Oftentimes our audio is already pre-synced inside the camera. So if the camera has an XLR or a mic input, the audio might already be in the camera. In that case, the production audio lands in the footage folder because it's already pre-synced. However, if the audio was captured separately, then it comes under audio here. And I've got two subfolders. First one is production audio. This is where all of your production audio, such as all of your lav mics, all of the boom sound, all of the folly, all the additional sound design elements that you might have captured on set, this goes in production audio. Now the, underneath the production audio, I don't have any subfolders, but you would build this production audio folder out in association with the footage folder down here. So if you have a production day one and you have a whole range of scenes, however you like to build out the file naming for your footage, it would be the same for your audio. This just allows you to understand what associated audio files fit with what video files. The second subfolder under audio is soundtrack. And under soundtrack, we have soundtrack temp, which is a temporary pull. We have a whole range of subscriptions online, such as Artlist and Musicbed. And when we're doing our research for projects, we pull temp files off Musicbed and Artlist, and they get put in this temp track file. And when our editors are working, we can source the soundtrack elements from that folder. Now, once an edit is approved, that is when the license track can be licensed online and pulled down into this final license tracks. And then the O3 license agreements and contracts, uh, any contracts that we might have with the sound designer or specifically Musicbed and Artlist. This is helpful because a lot of the times the client might request the license agreement just so that they understand that they are covered depending on the specific deliverables that we've delivered. So that's everything for soundtrack. This could be built out further if you are working with a sound designer and there's lots of backwards and forwards uh, revisions and elements being pulled through. But it's just nice to have everything associated with audio under audio. All right, so secondly, O2 footage. This does change depending on the project, but a general rule of thumb is to categorize everything by date and by the production day. You might like to categorize it by date and scene if the scenes are significant enough. But often for us, what we like to do is just simply ingest the cards associated with the cameras. In this case, there might be two cards from A cam and two cards from B cam underneath the first production day. And then all of the footage inside of these cards will simply be the raw files for that project. Once we ingest the raw files, we'll use something like DaVinci Proxy Generator to develop the proxies for that footage. And so for example, with this B002, you would have a proxy folder inside here that would have all of your proxy files generated from Blackmagic Proxy Generator. And inside this card name or B002, so this is the second card that was ingested from camera B, would have all of the raw footage in that. So it's really simple and it can be expanded through days. So obviously this is a day two and you would ingest the continuation of those cards for that project. This footage folder is obviously where everything sits or the bulk of the data sits. 
and it's nice just to have it up the top with audio. Now, O3 animation. A lot of the projects that we do in the commercial world require us to outsource animation to um, either visual effects artists such as green screen keying or someone like a 2D animator who will develop um, 2D movement within the image, um, graphic design, that sort of stuff. So O3 animation is where all of the round tripping to the animator takes place or any round tripping outside of the DaVinci ecosystem. We do a few things in Fusion, but if we have to move out to After Effects, then animation is where all of those round tripped um, assets would sit. So the logic for the first three folders is simply that one, two, and three, so O1 audio, O2 footage, O3 animation, mainly contain all of the working assets that the editor will pull into the timeline. Obviously audio and footage is self-explanatory, any animation elements on top of all of that. It's nice just to have that at the top and then the logic kind of continues down as the project progresses. So O4 assets, this is where we will host all of our assets that aren't associated with either audio footage or animation. So for this folder structure, I've just got two templated folders. One is logo and branding assets for the client. Now there could be 20 to 30 different assets brought into this folder um, at the start of the project, even before production, things like brand guidelines, which you can see here, style guides. Often brands have a very specific look and a specific aesthetic and font guidelines, for example, if you're doing any titling work. So this is just a really great place to have it. We used to host this folder on a different location on our server, but what we've started doing recently is duplicating the assets folder every time we start a new project for that client. So that basically keeps everything associated that could possibly be associated with the video project all within the same file structure and we're not sourcing assets from different areas on our server. So if I was to install a font specifically for the project, it would also go here under assets. Another final reason for keeping everything in one place is if we're relocating this project down the line or handing it off to an editor that might be offsite, it's really easy just to copy everything from this folder and we know that they are set in terms of every asset that they possibly need for the video project. So now we get to the folders that actually start to be developed as the edit progresses. So working renders contain everything that we will render throughout the process of an edit. There are different stages of renders. When we do our rough cut, we might render off a version for internal team reviews. We might render off another more polished version to send to the client. These are generally referred to as offline drafts. Offline rendering generally takes place before all of the sound mastering and all of the color grading. An online render is more of your polished renders or your stage two. So here under working renders, we put all of our offline drafts, all of our online drafts, and process renders is everything that we render throughout the project that is associated with the timeline. For example, it could be a rendered in place moment within the timeline that you've actually rendered a ProRes and brought back into the timeline that could go under process renders. The process renders could also be little things like exporting uh, dialogue out to be enhanced in Adobe Speech Enhancer, for example. If it was something like that and you're round tripping out of the program to bring assets back in, or if you're just doing renders throughout to just test different elements and they're not officially the offline or online drafts, all of those renders, anything that you render goes in process renders. This is also really good to keep it all there because often the offline drafts, there might be 10 to 20 of them as we are going down the line. And these can be cleared after the project, but you don't want to clear your process renders because a lot of them might be quite essential to actually keep the project alive and editable later down the track. So it's nice to differentiate what is an online draft, an offline draft, and an actual process render. 06 working edit files. As I've mentioned, we work in DaVinci Resolve and our working edit files aren't the same as, for example, a Premiere working edit file or if you're familiar with Illustrator or Photoshop. When you save a project in those other programs, you physically have a file that you can move around within your file structure. With DaVinci Resolve, the files live inside a database, which is a different beast to manage altogether. We back up our databases and we have a file management structure within DaVinci Resolve for that. 
However, I do often export versions of the project as I'm working. If it's a really big project and I'm spending like really chunky days working on a project, you know, eight to 10 hours of really dedicated editing time, I don't want to lose my work. Even though I've got a backup in the DaVinci Resolve server, I just really want an extra file that I know is there. So what I do is right click and simply just export a working edit file or a DaVinci Resolve project. And I'll have another folder with progressively saved um, working files for my project. Now also, if I'm, for example, opening up a Photoshop file, Illustrator file to do some design work for the client, just to sort some assets out to bring in to the project, these are where my working edit files will also sit. So any other edit files associated with the whole project outside of DaVinci Resolve also go here. 07 final renders is self-explanatory, but this is where all of my archived final renders will go. I do have another video here, and this explains a few of the different renders that I like to do, but also the final renders are essentially like the final package that you'll send to the client with a whole variety of different deliverables different outputs and the ProRes Masters and the H.264 online deliverables. That's a different video which I'd like to get to soon. So 08 DaVinci Project Archive is where the final archived project will sit once the project file is wrapped up. In DaVinci Resolve, it's really easy to export what is called a DaVinci Resolve Archive project or an archive file or a .dra. And this gets put in here along with all of the associated clips within the final timeline. So once the final timeline is locked, there might be say 20 final clips that are in that timeline and you don't actually need every single other clip from the project. You only need those 20 clips in the final timeline. And so the DaVinci Project Archive isn't actually that big of a file, but it's just another backup of the final timeline. This allows us if we ever have to open up that final timeline to make any tweaks, it's really easy. If we have completely moved the project out of our working server onto our archive server. You might want to skip this step and come up with your own archiving method. However, 08 is the final step in the process. Now lastly, 09 notes. This is where all of the notes throughout the project is generated. Throughout the project, if you're an editor, you'll be given notes potentially from the producer, from the director, from the client, any kind of um, onboarding preferential conversations to give some direction, all of those good things can all go in here. And also throughout the editing process, when there's reviews coming in, there's space here to put review notes, director, editor, production notes, and then transcripts. A lot of the time we get all of our interviews transcribed. Now in DaVinci 18.5, it does it automatically inside the program. But if we're using an external service such as rev.com, I still use rev.com a lot for all of my YouTube transcriptions. If we're using a service like that, we'll download the notes off rev.com and put them here as transcriptions. It's just a really great place to put everything to do with the project conversation, um, especially if you are dealing with multiple people, it's nice to keep it all organized there. So that's it, that is nine folders that can be expanded and contracted depending on the project. The great thing about having a really simple folder structure like that on the surface is even for the smallest job, I don't have a problem duplicating this folder structure and setting it up for a tiny job. But what it does allow is if the project blooms and becomes a really big project, this folder structure in my opinion is robust enough to sort of grow with the project. I've been using this folder structure in some way, shape or form for at least five years and we've literally done hundreds of different commercial projects with this folder structure. So I hope this has helped in some way. If you're just trying to get your head around how to organize all of your assets associated with video projects, and remember this is free to download with the link in the description. If you do have any questions, please reach out. I'd love to hear from you and we will see you in the next one. Peace out.